So welcome to Full Current. Usually on the show, we have like real conversations. We, we've had conversations about business, about Afrobeat, about life, about habits, about brokenness. Today's conversation is with a phenomenal lady called Dr. Esther Longe. She's a doctor, not like medical doctor. So can we put our hands together for that first of all? Nine people survived a plane crash that killed how many? There were 105 people on the plane. There were about 105 people on the plane, but nine survived, and she was one of the nine people that survived the plane crash. Welcome to Full Current. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> the first thing I want to say is, can you still remember that, that, that incident? Can you still remember it? I don't think you ever forget that kind of experience, even though it will be 17 years next month. Um, but there are incidents that happen that mark your life forever, and definitely that one is one of the top five. So I don't think you ever remember. So the top five, let's, I'll, I'll call three. Marriage is one. Yeah. Plane crash is two. <laughs> Childbirth. Salvation. Salvation is number, number, number one. Number one. That's what we see. Marriage. Uh, marriage. Child. child well, child, even before marriage. So let's say salvation. Salvation. Plane crash. Plane crash. Marriage. marriage childbirth. Child and then maybe PhD, even PhD, though you said, you said, you said, PhD, you said, you said it's not like uh, medicine. <laughs> PhD. We still went to school and spent PhD, five years. But, but, but it's funny, why would you copy us? Like doctor, why are hey, you trying to? Hey, why are you trying to? First and foremost, we use five years to study it, so put some respect so on you, our you name. So you have a PhD in what? Marketing. Why would you have a PhD in marketing? <laughs> in lying and sales and... <laughs> let's focus on this one, <laughs> right, let's so, fight. So, mm -hmm. honestly, um, I remember, I think two, three years ago, or last, no, I think two years ago, I prayed with you for a month, uh -huh. or, or, and I, my life changed. So Esther is a priest, priestess, <laughs> or a priest. But did the plane crash yeah. define your work with God? Was it from there that you started driving, like, Omo, Omo, I don't die? Was it sincere? Was it from there? No. And in, interesting enough, so I was, I was invi invited to speak somewhere this week, and they wanted to write, oh, after she survived the plane crash, you know, then she started doing all these amazing things for God. And I was like, you need to strike that out because that's not true. In fact, after the plane crash, I went into depression. They called it survivor's guilt for about two years. And why was this? Because for me, it felt like this was such an intense gift. What do you want from me? If you save me in such a phenomenal manner, you know, where, like I said, 105 people were on the plane, only nine survived, and only one had no injuries, and that was me, then what do you want? Do you want my firstborn, Jigget? Do you want, like, what, what do you need? Do you want me to go and be a missionary somewhere? You know, and then, um, you know, Nigerians are amazing people, but they can also put a lot of pressure. So people are like, go and ask God for your purpose. Go and ask God. In fact, people were saying, second Jesus. I was just like, what is all this pressure? <laughs> <laughs> this is too much, you know? And, you know, people kept coming to the house, just wanting to stare at this person that survived in such a phenomenal way, you know? And then newspaper headings, Miracle Girl survives, you know, all of that stuff. After a while, I started having panic attacks. And so my family reduced the amount of people that were coming to the house, you know, but I started feeling very unworthy. Like, why would you single me out in such a fashion? Because in that plane crash, the Sultan of Sokoto, his son, his grandson died. I knew deacons in my church growing up who died on that plane. A mother and four children died. So who is this peep squeak of a little girl that you would save and save in such a phenomenal fashion? And so I was just like, I don't know what you want from me because this burden seems too much. And it wasn't until, so I understand depression, you know, because you can be smiling, you can be the funniest person in the room, you know, and be, you know, detached from what is happening. It wasn't until my, I was in, I had moved to the UK at the time and I was in my church in Cardiff and one day we're just in praise and worship and the Lord said to me, he's like, if you can accept salvation, which is the gift of eternal life, you can accept this blessing in a life that still has trials and tribulations. So if you can accept the gift of eternal life, then you should be able to accept the gift of a second chance. And it, it seemed such like, you know, it seemed like an ordinary statement, but it brought so much light. And that is when the dark cloud of depression lifted. But even then, I still didn't know what the purpose was. So I said to God, I was like, okay, if all I have to do is just be worshiping you or giving the testimony on the anniversary of the plane crash, I will do that. And I did that for a couple of years. 
it wasn't until I had moved back to Nigeria at the time, and then I went to a program called Sorting Out, and it was in the worship. So for me, worship is one of the keys of my life. So we're worshiping, and this is 10, <coughs> 10 years after. So 2016. 10 years after. 10 years after. 10 years after, 2016, we're worshiping, you know, on the Sunday morning, and I just started shouting, and I'm not a shouter. I just started shouting, God, you are good. God, you are good. And in that moment, I realized that even if... Because I used to think that the Lord saved me for my mother's prayers, you know, this purpose that everybody was talking about, my future husband, future ki your kids or whatever. But Lord, I saved you for you because I love you. And that revelation just made me shout, God, you are good. God, you are good. And that is when I received emotional healing. So even though I had no physical scars, I had scars because I was wondering <laughs> inside, what do you want from me? Now... Um, that understanding gave me now the boldness to pursue God wholeheartedly. So they began to call me Water Walker because I began to take risks with God. But I'm sure we'll talk about it later. But the journey actually started in 2014 in intimacy with God. But 2016 gave me boldness in God because I realized that He chose me for me. Now, now a lot of people I know, a lot of people I know, and I'm still on the journey because. Most people don't want to say it, but salvation benefits man. Right. But purpose kind of benefits God. I, I won't say it benefits God, but doing what he called you to do on earth. It's partnership with it's him. Part yeah, it's, it excites heaven. Mm -hmm. It does excite heaven. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people I know have not found purpose. Now, some people think that purpose is like ushering in church, and it's not bad. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's part of the journey. Of, yes, I mean, what kind of church? To, what were the things that opened your eyes to your purpose? So 10 years, your eyes opened. What were the things? Okay, so in order to answer that question of purpose, because everybody goes, oh, I want to know my purpose, my purpose, my purpose. But you know that you don't have to be a Christian to do amazing things. Great. Right? Yeah. Right? So, I mean, there's so many non-Christians who are... Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Now, Phenomen Arsenal, hell. best club in England. Phenomenal. We're going we're gonna to disregard, <laughs> strike that from the record. <laughs> On behalf of my husband, another man, you fans, you know. But you don't have to be a Christian to do, if, do phenomenal things. But if you're talking about partnering with God in assignments, in destiny, in purpose, that comes from intimacy, comes from relationship. And I didn't discover a relationship with God until, when I say intimacy with God, I'd been a Christian since age five. We dedicated my life to Christ in, you know, school, 2003, you know. But in 2014, that's when I started walking in intimacy with God. Why? I had an honest conversation with God. I did not understand certain things. God, if you're so good, why this? Why that? Why is there suffering? Why is there heartache? Do you get, why did I go through this? Why did I go through that? All those questions made me ask God that if you're so good, then why? Why is there so much evil in the world? Why has so much, you know, strange things happened to me? And so I remember going to my church then I was in the UK. I was doing my PhD in Bath. And <laughs> a random person walks up to me and says, the Lord wants you to know that he loves your heart. Meanwhile, I was in a place where I was so angry with God. So I was like, which heart? <laughs> this heart. <laughs> because my heart was not, you know, if they're giving me prophecy, it's not me right then. They should have been giving me that prophecy. You know, and so I was like, which heart? And so I couldn't wait for the service to be over. You know, and because my church was a predominant, predominantly white church, I couldn't have said, oh, maybe it was somebody else they were looking for. It was me. And so I went into my room, locked the door, and I said, God, today we're going to have an honest conversation. If you're so good, then why plane crash? Why are my parents not together? Why, why? All the why questions I had. And then he showed me using Exodus 19 verse 4 that I brought you out of Egypt on eagle's wings. And I saw that literally and figuratively, the devil's plan was to have killed, stolen, and destroyed my life. But it's God that had saved and preserved me up until that point where I could now willingly surrender my life to him. That was in August. In September, I'm walking in my uni and we're having a conversation. I'm like, God, all of this delay in my journey would have been prevented if I had a safe space to ask my why questions, to say, I love God, but I don't understand this. I love God, but this is not, get, this is not adding up, you know? So, and he's like, yeah, so I want you to create that safe space. And that's how we started God in real life. 
So it came out of that intimate relationship with God and everything that we've done. So even the burdens on my heart, there are some burdens that I have that ordinarily I should not be having that kind of burden. You understand? Don't. <laughs> we'll get there. Weird burdens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I shouldn't be having those kind of burdens. But what the Lord is looking for is looking for people who will partner with him to carry his burdens. So, 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 so simplify it. Please. Simplify it. Mm -hmm. So that means the way we have pastors, mm -hmm. the way, because people always say kingdom, we're doing kingdom. Mm -hmm. And people don't really understand what, what, what that is. Why? Is God looking for partners? Why can't you do his God? I love it so much. I always talk about how, okay, so you have kids, right? Yeah. And they go to school. Yes. As loving a father as you are. Yes. As amazing a father as you are. Yes. If your child has a problem with another child or if there's a problem on the playground, for example, you cannot go to the playground and go and fight. Of, I can't. So what do you do? You empower your children with the keys and the tools to fight on their, on their own terrain. I hear you. I hear you. Okay. It's kind of shaking. <laughs> that's, that's it. <laughs> okay. Now, when you spoke about doing amazing things, amazing things, mm. people have said excellence. You know, say excellence is important in purpose. You know, mm. but you're saying it's first from intimacy. Intimacy. Intimacy with what? The Bible? Is it worship? What is intimacy? Yeah. So, yeah. so here's the thing, even, let's even talk about that thing called excellence. You know, it's like, for the longest time, and because I didn't grow up with my, my earthly father, me, I'm, we have a good relationship now, but I didn't grow up with him, I didn't understand the concept of God as a father. And so when they say, pray to God, our father who art in heaven, if God wanted to be our most righteous judge, he could have been. If he wanted to be the holy creator, he could have been to us. I mean, he's all those things. But when he's saying, how do you communicate with me? How do you interact with me? He's saying, interact with me as a what? Father. As a father. It doesn't mean that he's not the author of the universe. It doesn't mean that he's not majestic. It doesn't mean that he's not great, amazing, all those things. Mafia. But he's saying that when you're interacting with me, you're father. interacting with me as a father. Now, if you know... If you have a good relationship with your father, you want to make your father proud. You want to do things according to your father's standard. So all of those things come from relationship. Excellence comes from relationship. You can't give, your dad is doing something, you now come and do, you get, you show up in, in shorts and even if it's you for you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, son, you're yeah. having a family, you show up because you're representing your Father, he sends you on a meet, uh, on to, um, to represent him in a meeting and all of that stuff. You show up the way your father would show up because you know that he's trusted you with this mandate. And so I think that if people understood who God was and if people trusted God, because that's a different angle, you know, when he gave them, when he gives them assignments, the way they execute those assignments will be different. There will be excellence. There will be... Um, even great results which we're not seeing because a lot of times, and we're talking about this before we started, a lot of times when God gives you an assignment, you take the headline and you begin to run with it. You don't ask him for the strategy. You don't ask him for how he wants you to do it. You just go and do it. And then when you don't get the same results, you're now like... Now, now, did, did, did it cost you? Guys, did it cost you to, to do purpose? Of course it cost me to do purpose. Are you kidding? It cost you. Are you kidding? Must it cost? See, wait, wait. It's must. But why? Well, it, like, you say it must. It must cost you. It. it must cost you something. No, but why? Why, 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 why would it cost you? Why? Uh, well, <clears throat> personally, let me first start with my own cost. So, for me, in fact, I wrote my life plan at age 19. I have four degrees. You have four degrees? Four. Four. Yes, Dr. Foy, four. Please, please say it. <laughs> I have a BSc, I have two masters, and I have a PhD. Four. That I've laid on the altar of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now... <laughs> but you laid it on the altar. It, well, first and foremost, as the former president of the Stubborn Goat Club, I didn't exactly lay it. He kind of collected it from me, then I now lay it after. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but wait, but, but Esther, on a serious note. Yeah, please. Why will he allow you to do four degrees? Why will he allow you to see the world? He doesn't waste anything. He doesn't waste anything. But a lot of the things that we built were built on faulty foundations. They were built on our own ambition. They were built on our own agenda. But everything, the stands of our hearts, the fact that you have a medical degree, the fact that I have a PhD, he doesn't waste anything. 
But what he will require when we enter that journey of surrender is to first break every faulty foundation and build afresh with him. Because at the end of the day, the person that must take the glory for the work that the Lord is doing in and through us is God. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, so your works must be visible, but they must give the glory not to you, but to your Father in heaven. Now, if you don't build a right with God, the tendency will be, and we have seen it for it, that you do good works and you ascribe the glory to yourself. A man cannot handle glory. Even if they think they can handle glory. <laughs> at the end of the day, we're called to be work walking billboards of God's goodness. Do you understand why... Yahoo boys don't need to advertise. Ritualists don't need to advertise. Their work speaks for them. <laughs> they, have, they have lists. They have a waiting list to join them. But Christians, when they are making decisions, where are we? When they are doing innovation, where are we? And then you say, oh, I can't believe that Christianity is becoming an extinct religion. Where are all the Christians? Hello, it's your problem. You are the one that's not doing what you're supposed to be doing. The best way to evangelize is to be the best version of Floyd, best version of Esther, best version of the person that God has called you to be. Then people will say, who is your God? How can I know him? Just like when you shine your light to the point where they're like, uh-uh, me and Floyd went to school together now. He's brilliant, but this brilliancy is not on this level. As you get, who is your Godfather? Then you introduce them to who? God the Father. Ah, oh, more. Please come here, come here. Let's just, let's. No. But, 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 I've gone through my own. Mm -hmm. I've gone through, I've gone through, I've gone through submitting. So, for example, I never wanted to do Christian stuff. And I'm serious. My dad is a pastor. I'm with you, bro. My dad is a pastor. Mm -hmm. I grew up in church. Mm -hmm. Pastor Tony Rappu trained me. I have pastors. So, I'm like, I've seen church. I know one do. So, I ran to work for, like, secular companies, MTV, BET. Then God said, I want you. Yeah, yeah. But he, he stole it. He damaged me. <laughs> See, he jacked my neck. He jacked you do, my you neck. You do used to jack us. He jacked me too. Yeah? He's still jacking me. Yeah, He's still but, jacking but, me. But someone said that when God does that to you, it's a sign of mercy because he loves you. Yes. But explain that. I, I'm not the someone that said it to you now. <laughs> no, but, 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 yeah. but, but this is the thing. One of the things that we need to surrender to God or the most important thing is our will. And for a lot of us, growing up, that will has been reinforced. What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be? What do you do? When you meet somebody, the first question you ask is, what, what do, do you, you do? Want to do? What do you do? So nobody really cares about who you are. They care more about your output. What are you doing? And at the end of the day, God cares more about who we are, because he calls us human beings, before he says we are human doings. Doing. So what the Lord begins to do is begin to recalibrate our mind, because we are not... I'm not going to sound spooky, but we're representing a different kingdom. So you know kingdom. what? We're going to break now. Yes, and then please. when we come back, you, you will teach us as a PhD or a doctor Shandari. on the anatomy of will. Wow, wow. I, I, oh, wow. You Full will teach them. <laughs> we'll teach them. We're right back now. Thank you. Oh, now, now, the idea of full current came from like a Nigerian, you know, Nepal. It's like, imagine your light is half current. You can't charge phone. You can't blend tomatoes, but you have light. And we say that to get to the fullest current, you must be plugged into God. Now, we're speaking about yielding, mm. submitting. Yes. That word, yielding. Mm. Esther, may, can you share a, an experience of, of what you, of, of a point in your life where God said, I, don't do this anymore. Submit and, and it crushed you. It's, <laughs> yeah. Just say a point. Just one or just two. Just one. <laughs> one or two. And, and yeah. Okay, so, I mean, so I moved back to Nigeria in 2014, and my shoulder pad was on a different level because I was like, look, I was rounding up my PhD at the time, but I was like, I don't even need PhD. I've never had to suffer to find a job before. In fact, there was a time in my life where I was helping other people find jobs. And so I moved back and I was like, oh, in fact, which degree? I will use either first degree, I will use more masters or two. I didn't even have to wait. I was very proud, you understand? So I came back and I had the right people knocking on the right doors, you know, so they would go up and because I'm very, you know, proactive, I will now go, you know, from the middle, knowing fully well that, uh -uh, just get me in front of anybody, let's do the interview, I'm in. Uh -uh. <clears throat> I came back almost one year after I was still looking for work. 
May. And all of this had gotten married, so the marriage, the wedding planning was, had distracted me. But when we finished, I was like, what's happening here? And then I'll be praying, I'll be crying, I'll be like, Lord, give me my job, please, God, give me. Now, in all of this, I had started the God in Real Life. It was called Girl Talk at the time, God in Real Life Talk, right? And we used to do an online um, fellowship. So on Wednesday, we'll come together, find a topic, be talking about it. And I remember when somebody even offered me the opportunity to interview, I was only telling God, you know, when I start working, I won't have time to be doing this thing on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> you know that because I'll be busy working. I'm, I'm the only person that I'm be like, Yemu, mm, you're not giving you work here, right? you know? So, uh, uh, obviously, that one, they love my CV. In fact, I, they said, send your CV, sent it in 30 minutes. The head of the organization had already sent it to the head of marketing. Can we use this person? They said, yes, we'll get back to her in April after we do bloody, bloody blow. I was already like, yeah, my salvation have come. <laughs> it did not come. The second thing that happened, you know, even was, you know, Somebody in my life was knocking on the right door. He was so confident that I was going to get an interview from this company. I went to the company myself. And the head of the department, corporate comms that I had been working in, he had a PhD as well. So he loved me. that, oh, I like out-of-the-box thinkers. He even introduced me to the people. This is going to be one of our team. You know, I was like, yeah, yeah. I was going to tell the person that was helping me that, we have made it. Do you get I have approval even of, my, of you know, the person that will be my boss. You know, uh -uh. he said, okay, let's just release our books. You know, when our books come out, you know, end of the year, you know, pro post profit or, you know, and loss, whatever, then I'll make a case for you to be hired. It was supposed to happen in August. August came and went. It happened in October. I said, this company did not post a loss. They post a lost. You understand? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's 28 billion naira lost. I'm telling you, by, by um, December, this is October, by December, they were firing one in three. The last people, uh, last people in were the first people out. So I was like, well, maybe the Lord saved me from, because I would have been one of the last people to enter, <laughs> you know? But I was like, what's going on? So every time I'll be praying and I'll be crying, Lord, my job, my job. As soon as I get up from prayer, somebody from, you know, the fellowship would send me a message saying, asking for counseling. I said, me, I'm still trying to figure out my life. You're asking me to help you with your own. But it happened so many times that it wasn't a coincidence anymore. And I knew that God was trying to get my attention because the devil doesn't have that kind of power over my life. So one day, my husband comes back from work and he's like, are you tired of crying? Are you ready to hear from God? I said, yes, because by that time, I'm going to the end of my rope. And so he said, okay, I want to do a three-day retreat. Ask God to talk to you about your career, um, for me, PhD, because I'd come back, I was writing up, but I was still the same way I was, you know, I'd not made any progress, so PhD, and then ministry. If I'm being honest, I just added ministry, so it's not because if you're talking to God, you have to add what he likes, you understand? Why? Uh -huh. Because he was, because, yeah, 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 because that was not really part of my agenda. The first day, I sit with God, and he's telling me about ministry, and I'm really writing, you know, because he's like, I'm going to do a free conference, a co-hotel. And I'm like, sure, sure, sure. Because in my mind, this is when I'm 50 plus, you know, when I've made it in life. Like, I'm doing free conference <laughs> for people, you know. So I was writing it. He told me who to talk to. I, very comprehensive. I was like, okay, nice. The next day, PhD, he says, it's done. I'm like, what do you mean it's done? If I didn't have to write a 100,000 word thesis, you can tell me it's done. He's like, it's done. 30 minutes, he had, it was done. Then the third day, career day. I ended up repenting of my vain career ambitions, which was not how I saw that conversation going. Oh, yeah. So that was the last weekend in January. The next weekend, that was when I was now in that sorting out meeting, where on the Sunday in worship, you know, I now ended up you know, crying, God is good, and got emotional healing. So a series of things now happened, which were signposts. So I went for a Larry Olushala meeting, and he's like, the testimony God has given to you is a tool for evangelism. Don't waste it. I was like. And then I asked him to speak at the conference. We didn't have venue, we didn't have money, we didn't have anything, but we had speaker. And then God took me on this, it's a long story, took me on this whirlwind of an adventure to the point where by December that year, we had our first free conference at Eco Hotel, and I did not spend any of my money. The Lord provided everything that we needed. But I just thought that it's 10 years after the plane crash. This is my sacrifice unto the Lord, Sarah. You understand? Take it, Lord. Now release me and give me my job. Hey. As I knelt down after the conference, I even did like this, okay, I've done your own, can you do my own? He's like, I want you to serve me full time. <laughs> <laughs> the anger that filled my spirit, I said, meaning what? 
why did I go to school? You would have called me from secondary school, called me from Jigga, like, what's the meaning of this? What do you call this? So that's how, you know, who can battle with the Lord? Well, I tried, you understand? I battled with him from December to March the next year, where, sha, 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 I surrendered. So I pause. Yes, please. You battled. Yeah. So, so. How do you battle? No, 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 no. <laughs> When, when were you tired of, I say I'm tired, like what causes tiredness? When was, you understand? Like for example now, do you see you can apply for a job? Okay. Let me explain something <laughs> to you. Even, 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 even after that so-called surrender in March 2017, <laughs> I still used to beg the Lord till March 2019. I'm not joking. I'd done conferences. People now began to know Esther Longe as someone that is doing conferences. I was still asking for my job till March 2019. So I understand the difference between obedience and, and surrender. Kai. Because you can actually obey because it's God. You understand? If God has dealt with you one or two times, you know that you can't really fight him too much. So you can obey. But you can obey without fully being surrendered. Because you still have your own agenda. You still have your own desires. You still have your own. And for a lot of people that the Lord uses, his plan for their life and their plan for their life are in direct opposition. I wanted a quiet life. Husband, children, white picket fence, nobody disturb me, I don't disturb anybody. Money. Money was nice. You understand? I'm like holiday once or twice a year, just living my life, la vida without the what? Local. Local. Yeah. But this one that people are, like, in fact, I was private. <laughs> Do you know that I was born private on Instagram until that December conference? And my username was MightyM84, meaning that if I don't give you my username, you can't find me. Yeah. Yeah. That's how private I wanted my life to be. I used to call myself publicly private. Because things that happened to me that made it impossible for me to hide, plane crash here, this one there. But I didn't want to be someone that people wow. knew. So it was at that conference that Lord said, unlock this padlock of your Instagram. And I remember it was 2020 that I was saying to me, because I used to be so afraid. You know, I used to see how people would talk, you know, to people that are public figures online, talk anyhow, because like I said, please, me, I like my own space. I don't want to disrespect my life. I don't want to disrespect anybody. And the Lord asked me, he said, this was like, how many years later, four years later, I said, how many incidents that you were afraid of, how many have actually happened? No. Instead, well, one or two. There what was happened? one person that said, um, what do you mean you have four degrees? Do you get that? Why couldn't you focus? I said, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Nigeria, <laughs> they will tackle you. I no, like, but, but, I was but, like, what's the essence of this but question? Of that question. <laughs> no, but but but, so you so you gave up. You said, Lord, I surrender. Was when, it a was it a so twenty nineteen was when you stopped looking for a job? Yes, but so I like to be as authentic Open, as possible, yeah. right? Because people see people doing great things for God and they feel, oh, they're special, you get, you know, there's something about them. You hear, oh, Esther survived the plane crash, duh, that's why she's doing what she's doing. <laughs> it's a lie. Even after the plane crash, I used to say something very stupid, and it's so stupid. I know myself is stupid now, but it sounded so smart to me then. I said, I don't want to be known for plane crash. I don't want to be known for anything that I do not have anything to do with. If they know my name, let them know me for a Nobel Prize, blah, blah. It sounded very nice when I was you saying it. <laughs> it was a stupid thing I used to say. Wow. Because for me, I didn't understand. So if I didn't, and if you look at me, if I don't tell you, you never knew that I survived the plane crash. Never. Do you get? So for me, I used to hide. I didn't even just tell anybody. So when people, I'm saying everywhere I survived, plane, it wasn't until that 10 years after that I started sharing my testimony everywhere confidently. So Esther, now, did God give you his desires and you dropped your desires? Was it like, uh, Esther, this is what I want you to do? and then your own, drop it? Okay. Or was mm -hmm. it that, God, this is what I want to do, mm -mm. then exchange? That part can't work, that, this is what I want to do. That part can never work with our Lord Jesus when you're ready. <laughs> and so anytime somebody comes to me and says, you know, I was telling God that I want to do, I'll say, oh, <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, have not started Cheers. the journey. So you no, have to drop it like hop it Just drop it. And the Lord is very patient up until a point. Now, now, I'm not, it's not, what I'm saying up until the point, scary. I'm not saying no, I'm saying that we are in such a pivotal time that the Lord is activating people on an accelerated program. All that long group used to give us before, that rope is no long anymore. So you'll find that where you could, God will give an instruction, you will dance around it for six months, come back. He will do whatever he needs to do to get you to that point, especially if you're told God that 
I don't understand everything, but if you can use anything, you can use me. You won't cry <laughs> when you were singing it. Because I surrender all. <laughs> yeah, you get that? The, and the, and the, the cameraman took your picture <laughs> as you were I surrender all. Uh huh. He's not coming collect. He said, That thing you said on Sunday, can I have it in writing, please? You know? So he's not even wasting time anymore. The minute you raise your hand and you do that cry, that <laughs> <laughs> you have entered contract, one chance with the Lord. So for a season, you know, he was, he would show me a picture, he would show me something small, then I would lean into it. But now, the more I surrender, the more he puts his burden. And the wonderful thing about God's burden is that God's, God's burden is individual to the person. So you're going to have a burden for creativity. I may not have that burden. I have a burden for leaders. Do you understand what I mean? Somebody else may have a burden for um, people in secondary school. But whatever it is, if we all take on God's burden, we don't have to complain about the darkness that is covering the people or the deep darkness that is covering the earth because God has already made provision for light in Isaiah 60 verse 1 by you taking up your burden and shining your light. So... He gave you your desires. He told you this is what I... Go for me, my desire. Don't let me speak it over here. He didn't give me my desire. <laughs> what, did you, what did he say? He said, drop your desire, take mine. Then, let me now tell you what he now told me in 2020. Bob, Bob Cotto says, live my best life. Which life is that? <laughs> so, wait, wait, no, but, but, but but this is no, 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 no. Do, do you know what he now did to me? You know what he said to me? He said to me, I think it was either that 2019, when I was still begging for a job. He now said to me, so that, that year... Microsoft had called me to come and speak as their most inspiring woman of the year, that March, right? Yeah. March and uh, Women's Day. So the Lord now asked me, say, Esther, I want to market, I want to be CEO, 500, Fortune Company, whatever, you know? He says, would Microsoft have called you if you were living your own agenda? No. All these people that are calling you, would you have gotten it? So he's like, even your dream for your life is nothing compared to what I want to do in and through you. And the truth of the matter is that if I had my dream, for you will not know me. Nobody here will know me. I may have that comfortable life, but because God had already wired inside of me before the foundation of the earth, the desire for more, he had already written destiny into my DNA, I will not have been satisfied with whatever it is I was doing because he had already wired what? The more. So now he's like, look, you are here. And do you know there are places I've entered? How? People I've spoken to, people I've called to come and sit down that were doing conference. Why would they have known my name if I was doing mar this marketing that I was carrying on my head? But it doesn't waste anything because even when you know, when you do a medical degree, it's not wasting it. It changes the way you think. Totally. The way you analyze stuff. So the way I think, the way I talk is all a byproduct of this that I've gone through. This education. The, when people say, when you say Dr. Esther, they open the door because like this person is not just someone that's just talking rubbish. Do you understand? So nothing is wasted. And one day, Maybe he will say, okay, take that, your PhD, that doctoral research that you have, open a school, alternative business school. So God doesn't waste anything, but he wants us as we're building to build with him, to lean on him, because he wants us to have dominion. So whatever it takes is what he's going to do. So a lot of times we, surrend we fight surrendering because we think he's going to take something from us and give us less than. So the parable of the rich young ruler where he says, give me your most prized possession, and he goes away sad because he had so much control, so much influence. But the Lord was saying, because he knows how to make money. You know this, if you can make money once, you can make money twice. But he's saying, I want to give you not just influence here, but influence where it really counts. So a lot of times when God asks us for something, we're thinking, oh, he wants to take it from us because he wants to reduce us. He wants to make us less than. But no, he wants to increase our influence. He wants to increase our territory. And he knows that what we are seeing currently is not, we are limited. We are limited by, don't even get me on vision. Yes, I was here. So a lot of people that are watching, sometimes they're like, you're sounding like he's saying that everything you must do for him must be spiritual. Can no. he say you should do stuff in technology can he stay like can he he gave you a body for nigeria mm -hmm. before then you don't send nigeria yes i say it's on record on record <laughs> you know like for me he gave me some bodies that till now i'm like god i don't send like mm -hmm. you know, i don't mm -hmm. you know, it's not my but he gives it to you yeah and then he wants to be responsible yeah. respond like a son yeah my question is this thing he gives us must, is it always painted Christianese or it could be? No, it's not. How can it be? Because it says have dominion over the earth, not have dominion over the church. church. You are the light of the world, world, not the light of the 
church. church. You are a city that cannot be hidden. Do you know what a city is? It's not one person. It means that inside of you are businesses. Inside of you are people. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah. So how can you be a city set on a hill and you are not putting that city inside the church? I have to be careful. You have to be very me. careful. <laughs> but we have it all wrong. I'm not saying that it's not useful to serve in church, but that cannot be our primary place of deployment. There's a book that I read. I told you about the book that I love so much. It's called Church Shift by Sunday Adelaja. And it says, we are blinding ourselves with our light and poisoning ourselves with our salt. Plenty light, plenty salt. We're, we're not supposed to be <laughs> aggregating light and salt inside a building. It's supposed to be going out to the world. But we are so comfortable because we're like, ah, I'm talking to four now, we're dropping red. Oh, this is so amazing. Well, <laughs> I don't want to go somewhere where somebody will now say, what do you mean by this? Explain that. But that's where you're useful. So for me, I'm like, the church should be a place of deployment. Ask people, what are you good at? Okay, who are the people that have done it before you? Mentor them, do it. Esther, when God started calling you to leadership with women, with other business school, mm. I, I, I saw your, your Echo Hotel post. Mm. I saw it, we saw it. And we thought that there's a, a big girl <laughs> from UK. You understand? You came. You know, I saw it. You understand? Sincerely, did you feel sometimes inadequate? Hello? <laughs> Please. First and foremost, let me just explain something to you. I do hear that I said I don't have a job. <laughs> you understand? I don't say I should go and do conference in a co hotel. When I told my husband, when I said, You say what? <laughs> you say, We're well, both hearing God. To me, I never hear that one. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I was like, Who's my father, really? Do you get asking me to do this? In fact, I remember when I even confidently went to go and type to a co-hotel, I want to make an inquiry. The bill they gave me, I logged out of my email, <laughs> my internet, <laughs> I logged out. In fact, from February to April, I just go and greet God. Good morning. I will not stay too long because the last time I stayed, I know what you said to me, so I'll just be greeting him. But the thing about me and the thing that helps me is when God asks me to do something that is impossible, I tell everybody, hey, come and help me. Oh, come and hear what the Lord said. Oh. So what now happens is that they now become accountability partners. So I ran from February to April, and then I went to one fellowship one time, and she said, ah, you said that God asked you to do whatever, how far? Then another one of my friends who were both in Bath, University of Bath together, you know, and I was telling her, now she's a very logical person, so I thought that if anybody would tell me that I'm not hearing right, it's, it's this hard. auntie. When, and then, no, that time I also became pregnant in the middle of all of this. So how can I do conference when I'm supposed to have my first child? But she was like that, if the Lord is telling you to do it, then that means do it quick. <laughs> That's how I knew it was all over Jackie. You understand? That's what I had to do. So, so at every point in time, he would give me signposts. He would tell me, I want you to do this, I want you to do it. Then I didn't have money. It's not as if I had maybe some money saved that, okay, last, last, I'll just drop it. I didn't have what they call something like a shishi. You understand? I didn't have no it. No shishi. Me, no shishi. You understand? Yes, sir. This is now October. The conference is what? In December. And I remember that my pastor at the time Kai. saying, he was saying, oh, that if you, if you want to get people, you need to go on radio. And for us, 10 minutes then, or 10 minutes on radio was 77,000. I said, Father, as you shake me up and shake me down, <laughs> I don't have this money. Do you understand? <laughs> so if you're calling me, you've got to provide. And that's one thing that we need to hold God to. Because I've seen so many people that God asks them to do stuff, and then they're trying to do it in their own strength. If God is the one sending you, the bill is on him. And so all of a sudden, because I, I, I even had to go and finish my PhD then, so he answered all, the, all the, the prayer points. So I was defending my PhD, defending my PhD on October 2nd, had my child on October 13th, you get, um, did my, no, submitted my PhD on October 2nd, had my child October 13th, had my PhD viva on my birthday, November 15th, came back to Nigeria November 26th, and the conference is December 5th. Who does that for their first conference? But the Lord said something. He said, if you will trust me. <clears throat> so I now had volunteers, you know. I'm not telling them, I say, I know I'm asking you to walk on water with me, but I trust that God is going to do something amazing. Boy, you will not believe that the deposit we had to pay, it was amongst that group of 10 that they raised it. I didn't spend one couple of my money. We got there, God started giving us different discounts. First of all, food was what was going to make that budget double. He said, I didn't ask you to feed them. They're not here for physical food. What they want is food that only I can give them. That cuts half the budget. We got favor. The budget was half. Then I moved back. To, I came back to Nigeria. All of a sudden, a 10-year-old testimony. Foy. 
people just started saying, ah, we heard there's a, someone that survived the plane crash. Come and share your testimony. TV, radio, one hour, not 10 minutes, free. As I'm telling my testimony, I'm saying we're doing conference, as well as everywhere. That's how he did media talk for me, free of charge. We did that conference on a Monday. It wasn't a public holiday. That room was full with 300 people in attendance. But that's not even the end of the testimony. We paid. We got 400K back as security deposit, meaning that we didn't even end up with zero. We got money back. So I have seen God move. I have seen his template. And it comes from believing him, trusting him, and taking him at his word. Because it is in God's best interest that you succeed at the assignment that he gives to you. It is in God's best interest, God's best interest that you succeed. Because you are we'll, bearing we'll, his name. We will soon go on a break. Yes, please. But we'll start, we'll start one part of the conversation. Now, the, the final part of this convo will be about Nigeria nation, this building. But I want to talk about persistence. OK. Some, sometimes, in giving birth, you have to push mm -hmm. and push and, and push. Yeah. And sometimes pushing is, is not funny. I, my wife, I have two kids, my second child, my wife pushed in the bathroom. I took She's off. She's a strong woman. I ran. <laughs> I, and I'm a doctor. I said, <laughs> persistence. Mm. Just talk about why must we, even if God said it, you have to persist. Why? It builds muscle now. No, no, they go gym. I started again. I started okay. Again. <laughs> I, th I, I go, I well, God, thank you, I go. <laughs> It builds muscle. It builds muscle. See, I have to ask, and before we go on, you have to ask yourself why the Lord left the enemies of the Israelites in the promised land. Why didn't he decimate the enemies? Why did they have to be conquering territory bit by bit? Strength. It builds strength. Have you noticed that people that they hand them leadership on a platter, they, they, they think that their fathers built in one week, one, just give them. One week. The, the may have finished that, we'll build it. <laughs> Do you get it? If you want to build legacy, it has to come from somebody who understands what it takes to build. You have to understand what it takes to build. And as you are doing the small battle, that's why the Lord starts off with small battles. It builds confidence. It's just like in the gym. You know, my trainer is always abusing me because I'm still carrying two kg. I'm saying, where? Before I was carrying an ever bottle. You understand? <laughs> it's from glory to glory, you know? Because she, she's, doing, she's doing 5 kg, 6 kg. I'm like, one day, it's pride. You get one day, I will reach there, you know? But it's in the little battles. It's in the little bits of surrender, submission, that the Lord now says, OK. Because if the Lord showed us, if he showed you where he was taking you to, you will faint. You will, you, will say, you, will say, you will say, oh, Lord, show me my future. You can't undo that future. If God showed Joseph his future, really? How? That is not just brothers that will bow to him, but a whole kingdom. Because it was star and moon. Do you, do you know something I found? I found that this is how the Lord works. And I, I mean, don't quote, but if you are a big picture person, he will show you details. If you are a detailed person, he'll show you big picture. Why? Because he needs you to depend on him in your place of weakness. Wow. Wow. So a lot of times for big picture people, you're like, show me, show me where we're going. So you make it make sense. For, for detailed people, I know what you've shown me. How do I get there? The how do you get there, the journey from here to there, is in dependence on God, is in submission. Because more important to God than the assignment is the relationship. He's the light to your feet and lamp to your path. Why, why, do you get, why is it only one step? He's showing you. It's tough, man. Ah, because man. he needs you to trust him. God is a relational God. You don't, <clears throat> see, even God himself is three in one. Did you see that? If you have watched Chosen, I've only watched one season. God wants me to watch the remaining because I need to. But you see that Jesus liked people. Sha. Apart from the 12, he was always guarding. I'm like, it's like you really like people. God likes people. He made us for relationship. He'll come and worship with us, um, fellowship with Adam in the cool of the night. He likes relationship. So when he's giving you all these visions, how you know it's a God vision? It's because you cannot do it on your own. You cannot do it in your own strength. It must make you afraid. If the vision doesn't make you afraid, it's not from God. We'll go on a break now, mm -hmm. and when we come back, we'll talk about your passion for national building. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's Fuku and Mixing Noise. <laughs> and we're back to Fuku and Can you, can you, can you make some noise? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, so, so Esther has broken down how sometimes you drop your life's dreams like hot potato. <laughs> <laughs> and follow God. 
the, the idea of sacrifice and that most times the exchange is worth it. All yes. the time is yes. worth it. Now, before we talk about one of your passions about Nigeria and, and, and anti, she's anti japa I don't know. I didn't, say, I didn't say that <laughs> before tomorrow. Yeah, I've gone and said, ah, oh, Esther. <laughs> but how do you hear from God? How, now, people are watching everywhere, TV, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, atheists, some people that got us tea. Esther, some people got, they heard from God, but it didn't work. It, it, it's, you understand? So hearing from God, how, what is your own process in hearing from God? So when people ask me, because I get this question a lot, well, how do you hear from God? Well, the first place or point of reference is his word, right? The Bible. If you don't open the Bible, then you can't say you haven't heard from God. So, oh, Esther, I haven't heard anything from God. Every time I'm waiting, I'm listening. Open his word. <laughs> that's the first place. In fact, for me, that's the place that stands the test of time. His word. Because you can always doubt what you hear, but you can't doubt what you you see, in fact, for me, what I hear must corroborate what I have seen and vice versa. Now, it's, it is a process. It's like learning a language, right? You don't learn the language, you know, you don't learn French overnight. I tried to learn French, you didn't really work out like that, you know what I'm saying? But you learn the alphabets <laughs> from the alphabet, you learn the, you know what I mean? You it's build. Journey. So a lot of times people want to hear from God, they're like, tell me who my spouse is. You have never heard before that day. Is it your spouse that you want please, to hear? Please, those that are single here, don't, don't use God. for It's dangerous, so. Because mm -hmm. you're going to hear something. You now say, the Lord said, <laughs> meanwhile, the person has ring. Which Lord said this? <laughs> you know? So what I usually tell people is start from the basics. What should I wear today? What routes should I take? Things that you know are small but easily measurable. So, for example, and once you... Because what people don't realize is that you are not searching for God half as much as he's searching for you. Say it again. You are not searching for God half as much as he's searching for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. So a lot of times the way it is sold is that we have to be perfect. We have to chase. We have to be the one to almost like die for God. But he died for us first. If you realize that he's already given the biggest sacrifice, whatever he's asking you to give is nothing in, do you get, that is commensurate what he's, give me, can you give me your first child? Of course not. Z Ziva, can I give you Ziva now? Can you give me, um, what's Zara. Zara? Can you give me Zara? I can't give, I can't give you Zara. Can you give me charity? Why would I give charity? <laughs> I hear you. Do, do you understand? He gave the one thing that was the most important. How many other sons do you have that the Lord have? No. So he's, so he's he asking wants you to talk. give career. He's asking you to do this. And you think, oh, he wants to steal from me. <laughs> he's already giving you what's most important. He wants to amplify it. Unless a seed falls to the ground and die, it cannot bear much fruit. So for me, back to hearing from God, ask him for the little things. Hearing from God is like tuning a radio to the right frequency. God is always speaking. When they say God is silent, he's silent about what you want to ask him. Because what you want to ask him is your agenda. And you're just like, I'm here, Lord. I want to know what's going to happen in the next five years. What are the 10 steps to do before I blow? Do you get all of those things? And God is like, um, no. We're going to talk about your healing. We're going to talk about healing from childhood trauma. We're going to talk about, you know, these character traits that we need to deal with because it is easier to solve those things you get in the dark than when the spotlight is shining on you. So you sit with God, and then he begins to deal with those things, and you're like, this is not why I came. <laughs> I, took, I took leave from work for this. Do you understand? So, like, I need you. I need you because I have badly. six months to decide if I'm going to quit this job or not because, you know, the vibes are not given. I'll be out with them just <laughs> said, so, you know? So, you know, you're like, God. But he's like, I know where I'm taking you to, and so I have to pull you back because it's like a slingshot. Pull you back so that you can go far. So you're asking God for the little things. So when you're trying to build up your confidence, you know, say, okay, Lord, what route should I take? He now says, your job, you can either take uh, Mozumba or you can take um, Lekki Bridge. He says, take Lekki Bridge. Lekki Bridge is further than Mozumba. But you take it and you get to work an hour before everybody else. Question, just on this. When you meet God, uh, God gave us choices. Mm. He did. He was, I, I chose the best club, Arsenal. 
you chose man you <laughs> you chose it God gave us choices. You are lucky this is your a podcast. Human being chose it. You talk and you choose my you. You're, you're lucky this is your podcast. <laughs> now, this is my question. Yes, please. It's like God wants us to submit our choices to. See, yeah. It's like He wants everything. Yes, He does. But yes, but the thing is, this is it. Hey, cut, 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 cut. Allow us breathe. Allow the poor breathe, God. Allow us breathe, God. He wants everything. God is looking for your nose, your nose to everything. He wants everything. Yes, so, ah. so, so. I, my first child, I have a daughter, right? And before she chose me, I chose her. Yeah. Now she's chosen me. Now, there are things that I see from where I am that she doesn't see. For example, her birthday is next month. She wants a hoverboard. She's going to be seven. I cannot give her hoverboard. Not she, because I can't she, afford she it. Her. But because there are two things that are very valuable to her, <laughs> she gets, and she's not in a position to lose them. Yeah. Now, for her, if I don't give it to her, mom is withholding from me. But because I see, I'm saying, I'm not saying you're going to get it, but when you get it, you can handle it. Now, on the journey to hoverboard, she are watching videos on protection and buying you knee pad and buying all of those things because I'm preparing you for the promise. I think that one of the things that will liberate us as children of God is having the right perspective of God. If you look at God as somebody who is a hard taskmaster, trying to take from you, trying to make you live your worst life, then anything he asks you to do will be seen as painful. In the last 18 months, and I'm not talking theory here, in the last 18 months, I went through relational heartbreak. Different relationships that were supposed to be working just were going left, right, and center. And I was like, God, why are you doing this? I know I said, God, what's going on? I said, I'm the one that is doing it. I say, <laughs> me, I am about to have a problem because I'm in so much pain, and you're saying that you're the one that is doing this. I said, yes, I need to increase your capacity because you have revolved your life around these relationships, but there's so many more people I have called you to. So for a season, he paused those relationships so that I could look at other very unlikely relationships, things I would not have looked at. But because he needed me to expand my view, because he said to me, he said, whenever I'm stretching you, it's painful, but I only stretch because I want you to have capacity to receive. You never stretch for no reason. When you are stretching, you are saying that the person's capacity is limited, so you are stretching so that there can be more given. So even in the things that are painful, even the decisions that are painful, even in the sacrifices, listen, is the difference between, sorry, I'm going to look for trouble here. It's different between going to Harvard and going to a state school. It's still the same amount of time you spend in school. It's still maybe on some level the same kind of school fees, but the difference is clear. When you come out, you don't come out like the person that went to the state school. You are flying. You are, so do the work because the, it will show. It will show when you have been in God's presence, when you have been in his school, it will show. The people have been, when you are an overnight wonder, not knowing that you have been in his process. When you talk, you talk with authority. You talk as someone that knows what you're doing because you have submitted yourself to the process. Submit yourself to the process. The benefits, the dividends are beyond. And the truth of the matter is that if you understand that you're called to be both a king and a priest, there are rights, privileges, but there are also responsibilities. You cannot have one without the other. Esther, so People are here, we are on Instagram. We check ourselves out. We have to, we have to be, there's FOMO, fear of missing out. You understand? We have to be there. We have to be, you understand? We have to be where? We have to be, we have to be, we have to be in the Zuzu. <laughs> well, understand? The inside, inside it. <laughs> okay. But then there's so much pressure that we all are working with different people's clocks, not God's clock. Sometimes, did you have to sometimes separate? Did you have to sometimes look like a mumu? Of course. Ah, <laughs> let me tell you, you haven't gone far to Instagram. I remember when I was in the middle of this, my submission journey in 2016. So I was still writing on my PhD then. And one of my friends that we did PhD together, he had finished, he called me. And he's like, so Esther, what's your plan? What's your life's plan? I say, like, where do you see yourself in five years? I said, I don't even know where I will be tomorrow. And the way he looked at me as almost like, how can you have a brain? How can you have, you know, you're almost done with your PhD and you don't have a plan? Like, what are you doing with your life? I cannot, you know when someone looks like you with disappointment, you cannot <laughs> forget that look. Please, let me just explain to you. Two years ago, I was now in, he's married to one of my very good people now, right? And I was in their house and he was telling me, 
you know, I always use you as an example of what it means to just trust God. Just follow God. Are you serious? Listen, if they follow people, you will enter what they, they will carry away, you don't know. <laughs> he said, I always, you know, that even, I just remember, like, I always, I always tell people that, you know, an example of someone who trusts God, I follow, I say, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but years wow. ago. Wow. Also, please, we know this, but let me retreat it. You cannot be moved by what is happening in somebody's squares or highlights. Do you know that this year I've had so many videos go viral, but they were going, the first video that went viral went viral at a time when I was the most confused in life. How does that happen? That you are saying words that are liberating people, you are... but you yourself are asking God, what are we doing? Where are we? And the truth of the matter is, we say this thing like it's a one and done journey. But the higher the Lord takes you, the further he takes you into him. Remember Ezekiel, ankle deep, knee deep. Shoulder deep, don't you, you are immersed. And you are immersed and you're like, I can't swim. Oh. If you don't lead me, I'm going to drown. So we always feel like we have to have it all figured out. We have to present like we have it all figured out. No, that's why it is good to just follow who no road. By the time you're following him one step after the other, you will look back. It's always in retrospect that you look back and you see how God has ordered your steps. Every conversation we've had now has been in retrospect. All. As they were happening, I could not tell you that I'll be here in 2023 talking to Foy on Pop Central, you get, you know, when I was going through what I was going through seven years ago or six years ago. So give yourself grace. Breathe. Breathe. Allow yourself to breathe. Breathe. Exactly. It's not God that's not letting you breathe. It's you that's not allowing yourself to <laughs> now, breathe. Now, God has given you. I met Esther, and Esther, honestly speaking, it was two years ago. I'm like, I thought I was even faking it. Let me lie to you. <laughs> She was passionate about Nigeria. I'm like, who is a young person passionate about Nigeria? And I'm being real. Mm -hmm, I, I, mm -hmm. Even till now, I'm passionate about an industry. I'm passionate about the creative industry. I'm passionate about, about Afro. But Nigeria, ah, I'm just, I'll be, I, I'm still, Nigeria has shown us shake You see? <laughs> 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 shake us shake My fuel tank. I got 10K fuel. Now, 10K is like, <laughs> My father is, is doing echo. So, mm -hmm. Nigeria is one of your passion points. Why? Why Esther? I, why is a baby? See how you are. Like, <laughs> so what? You know, take about Nigeria, please. So, so it was in 20, 2020. Now, April 2020. Before then, I used to tell people that. My passport is green from Zion. You understand? I'm not really from around here. <laughs> I used to tell my husband to that. Ah, even if it's just my own qualifications alone, they're looking for us in Canada. There's red carpet that is waiting for us. We don't have to even add the zone. Just add my own. We're already inside. But it's about taking God's burden. So in April 2020, now, you know, I was brushing my teeth. You know, I'd gone through another season where I was disappointed with God and I wasn't understanding what was going on. And so I just found my worship, you know, and I was just coming back into that place of fellowship and I'm brushing my teeth and he says, well, I want you to do 7,000 conference. And based on, you know, um, First Kings 19, blah, 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 and all of that stuff. And he told me, broke it down, how he wanted me to do it. Now I'm used to doing projects for God. If it's conference, nobody comes from we can do this conference, you know? But I was in a meeting, before I even saw you that week, I was in a meeting and I just remember sitting and the Lord said to me, when I saved you, I gave you a, he didn't use that word, I'm, because I'm on camera, he didn't use that, but he said, I, what he said in essence was, I gave you a burden for Nigeria and I said, I don't, I gave him back, I don't want it, <laughs> you guess, you know how they do, so as you gave me a more dark water, bah, I don't want it, you guess, you know, as I gave it back, the person that was leading the service just turned and said to me, receive the builder's anointing. <laughs> hey! I started to cry, I started to shake. For like 30 minutes, I was just crying and shaking. I was crying, you know. I did not want it, I was weeping. Then that week, I would go to meeting here, you get, things changing were just happening to me, encounters, I'm like, what is going on? But it was a journey to surrender, but I first had to forgive Nigeria. Because Nigeria had broken my heart. Nigeria broke my heart. Imagine being in that plane crash and the minister in charge at the time 
said when they asked him how we had had six plane crashes in this in the space of 18 months and they asked him why are so many air incidents happening and he said why are they asking him is he god <laughs> <laughs> nigeria has broken a lot of heart esther a lot even, no so so for me one of the first before we even talk about anything nation building or anything like that we have to talk about actually forgiving nigeria and nigeria and those that are in charge asking for nigerians forgiveness i had to forgive nigeria when I realized that that was the direction he was taking me in, I had to forgive Nigeria. And the more I forgave Nigeria, the more God gave me his burden for Nigeria. Now, for me, Nigeria is made up of Nigerians. Nigerians are phenomenal human beings. Nigerians are doing amazing things. Put us anywhere, we will thrive. So my burden is for when Nigerians are collective. That may be in Nigeria, <laughs> but wherever Nigerians are, we got to thrive. And I remember when my plane crash video went viral, I said, even if God sends you out, even if you, you cannot stop fighting for this country, there's too much invested in this country. Do you understand how amazing we are? Do you understand how brilliant we are? That we will not thrive? That my children, and when you have children, it gives a different twist. Is it in this, I've lived in the UK for almost eight years. You can never be a first-class citizen in anybody Man, else's country. Call it spade a spade and not a shovel. Come on, guys, let's be real. You can't. Talk. This is ours, but we got to build it. Do you know what I mean? But I think that one person can't do it. When you said you forgave Nigeria, mm. Esther, be realistic. Yes, I'm realistic. I'm still forgiving our team. I'm still forgiving. Mm. So it's a journey of forgiveness. Yes, yes, because, yes. Because people were people have been people. Nigeria has. I know some. So I worked as a doctor for two and a half years, mm. for 18 months. It, I, I know, I know, I, and I worked with the Federal Military Hospital in Yaba. Bro, mm -hmm. oh, there was a guy who went for war, a military man, came back, lost his leg, and they gave him 150K. You understand? I've, ah, forget. My body is, I've seen, see here, I've seen some like, is it possible to forgive Nigeria, Esther? It is. It or is, is it just wisdom? I just say wisdom. No, no. See, I mean, pragmatism can take you in different directions. You can join them, you yeah. can leave, you can do whatever. But in order, you can't truly love Nigeria without forgiving her. And you find that a lot of people have entered a free for all. Everybody is for themselves. And that's because for them, the country has hurt them so much that they're like, I don't believe in the future of this country. Let me just get what I can get and, and get out. And, and, get out. Yeah. Or, and that get out, they may not leave the country, but whatever opportunity, get what I can get, get. You know, and that's where you see corruption. That's where you see all kinds of things because we no longer believe in a common vision. We no longer believe that there's something that can be salvaged or is salvageable. And so one of my burdens, and you know this, is to actually rebrand Nigeria as a unicorn nation, as a, unicorn, as a nation that is worthy of your emotional, financial, and mental investment. But it cannot happen overnight, and it cannot happen in our current state where we are so fractured and divided. People are hurt. And you cannot paper over it and act like, you get their hurt doesn't matter. Because then it now begins to feel like you are raping them of their emotions. It's a very strong word and sentiment, but that's how a lot of people feel. And whether you voted for one side or the other, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how did, how did people feel in the process? So even for whoever is leading, you have to bring people together. You have, because we're divided. People saw the underbelly that they had never been exposed to, and they're still trying to figure out how to recover from that. I'm still recovering from that. I have no problem with whoever is wherever. Do you understand? I'm not, but I'm saying there are ways to do things. There are ways to get people on board. You can't just run roughshod over people and act like people's emotions don't matter. You have to be able to call people and say, look, okay, we're here now. How can we make this thing work? Because the average Nigerian actually wants whatever ideas God has given to them to work. And they need the environment to work so that they can work. So it is in everybody's best interest for Nigeria to work. So what we need now is to begin to find out how we're going to do national healing. 
day of national prayer, whatever <laughs> it takes, Jige, national concert. These, they sound like jokes, but they're actually things that are steps in the right direction, that lets people know that their feelings matter. That's only when people can be invested in building this country. Because guess what? In Nigeria can leave Nigeria today and they will thrive. They will hustle until they make it and they will thrive. But at the end of the day, we have to make up our mind, do we want to go our separate ways or do we want to build this nation? If we want to build this nation, then there are ways to go about it. In your, in your quiet moments, yes, please. in your introspection, reflection, do you, do you think God is with us? Of <laughs> Hello? Wait, wait. No, no, let me know. Before you ask, have you yeah. seen what make people go to war in other country? It's not, it's just, someone just woke up and breathed the wrong way to get there at war. The Russian-Ukraine war, ego, they're still there. We thought it was going to be a quick war. This is almost two years now. It is the Lord's mercy. Young people say, oh, let us just, you know, scatter. <laughs> the appearance, that's why they don't want to see it again. The way that you're able to afford you wear cross now, you have to be wearing a Timberland boots because at any point you can run. <laughs> you to run. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, there is an ease, no matter how bad as it bad, bad as it bad, do you think, oh, you have a foreign passport? If they lock down the airport, how will you leave this country? Oh, you have friends that have private jets? <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand? There are realities that we're not ready for. So I hear people are saying, oh, let's just, you know, everybody go, they're separate. But we're not ready for that. And the reason why we have not reached that place is because, and you know that we have gotten to so many points, even this year alone, where it would just take the wrong look sideways and would have been in a different position. It's God that has been keeping us. I feel like we can get to the country that we want. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't ha There will be a way. I don't want to say it doesn't have to be extreme because you cannot get what you want without sacrifice. But the sacrifice does not have to be blood. The sacrifice will be you putting your agenda under national agenda will be you getting into a place and not trying to line your pocket. Do you understand what I mean? It will cost you. You will look stupid. But it doesn't have to be bloody, but it will cost you something. Many times, listen, you were talking about me looking stupid. Do you know how stupid I look when I talk about loving Nigeria? Or more. Do you know how crazy I look when I talk about a burden for Nigeria? People say even, boy, that day that we did um, doing business with integrity, that I played my plane crash video that it went viral. Yeah. I was leaving the studio, just like this studio now, as I was leaving outside. One of the sound guys said to me, so Esther, you want to say that um, if you have the opportunity to jackpa, you will not jackpa. <laughs> After we have spent money to do conference, <laughs> we have invited people to come and talk. T.Y. Bello, Cosmos Maduka. Everybody. They have sat down. Yes, so, so, so that and somebody says that to me. I entered my car and I wept for him. I cried. I cried in my car. I drove home, I cried. I slept crying, I woke up crying. In the middle of all of that, you were sending me a message. Hey, see where wants to post or whatever. I was crying as I was replying. You did not know. I cried that whole day. Now, you said you wanted to repost the video. So I had to post it. I'm not trying to post that video. I posted the video, sent it to you. The next day, she posted, and life as I knew it changed forever. What am I saying? You can be doing what God is asking you to do. You can be crying, but keep moving forward. One day, it doesn't have to make sense to you as long as it makes sense to God. In 24 hours, you people say you want to blow. 24 hours, I had 10,000 new followers. In 24 hours, my video had had 1.5 million views. And I asked God, why is it 15, that it was then 15 years, 15 year testimony having so much traction? He said it's because of those last few minutes about Nigeria. Whether you know it or not, whether you believe it or not, people are looking for, just give me something to believe in. Give me a message of hope. Give me something to hold on to. Because everybody at their heart, well, not everybody, most people want Nigeria to succeed. But when you are looking at the terrain, and that is why we must believe in something higher, something greater, a different kingdom, the kingdom of God. Because if you are looking at what is on ground, I will meet you in the airport tomorrow. <laughs> but we have to believe in God. We have to believe about what he said. There are too many words about Nigeria. There's too much investment in Nigeria. There's too much that God, we have gold. We have so many resources. We have to believe that he has a plan. But do you know what? I don't have to see the full picture. That is my freedom. 
I don't have to see how it will end. That is my freedom. All I have to do is my own part. If I do my own part, you do your 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 own part we will have the Nigeria that we desire. What happens a lot of times is that we are waiting for other people to do their part and we're not doing our part and then nothing gets done. done. Do your part. That's all God needs you to do and you'll see what will happen. It's coming clap. <laughs> I'll be sincere and say that you're one person that has made me think about Nigeria as, as a unicorn nation. And what, see, let, let me be sincere with you. So I work, I've worked in entertainment. Nollywood is not government. Is is young people did it start up. This Afro beat Bonner boy, David, all these guys start up. Even Afro gospel now. So so, Nigerians know how to thrive. Yeah. We know how to push. We know how to push ourselves. As we round up, I want to ask you go back to just one or two personal questions. And the first one I will ask as we close out is people here deal with, and I, I know, imposter syndrome. They deal with it. And it's like even the Bible, some of the Bible people dealt with it. They, uh, Moses dealt with imposter Gideon. syndrome. Gideon. Yeah. People deal with it. When you went, because what you are, you, are, you are believing that Nigeria will change. And uh, Esther, you, if some senators have tried, if some women, I won't call their names, have tried, obviously, oh, Christianly, just because it's how it was wrong with Esther. I'm, being, I'm just being honest yeah, with you. It's fine. And sometimes, yesterday I was saying that, and, and I repent, because yesterday I have a body for the, for the body of Christ, not the church. But I'm like, I called a few names. I said, ah, if, sir, I said, for you, are you a fool? This guy did it for 15 years in New York. I said, for half cents. But I repent. I repent. Today I'm repenting that. No, I'll still fight. How have you dealt with imposter syndrome sincerely? And does it still happen to you today? I think that one of the things that has helped me with this thing called imposter syndrome is that I realize it's not about me. Imposter syndrome is looking at you. I'm feeling inadequate, but it's not about me. As, as you rightly said at the beginning, I'm not necessarily poor, you understand? If I need to buy a ticket for my whole family to live, I can do so. It is God that has put the burden on my heart. And so all I'm doing is recognizing that I'm partnering with somebody who already knows the end from the beginning. It sounds spiritual, but it is what it is. Because if I'm trying to impress, and I'm not trying to impress anybody, if I'm trying to impress you and tell you how knowledgeable I am, that's why there's some conditions I don't enter. Do you understand? Because I don't have the knowledge base for it. But one thing I can tell you, and I'll tell you, is what God has told me. And I'll tell you because I'm not the one that said it. And so because I'm not the one that said it, Jiget, I'm not the one that has to defend it. <laughs> so a lot of times when I enter into spaces, and I used to suffer with this, you know, where, you know, I used to want to be a powerful speaker. Ephesus or the power. Power. Data. Pa. And when I'm speaking, people pa, fall on there, you know. Pa. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to be so annoyed because when I feel like I'm speaking with power, people are like, oh, I like you, you're so soft spoken. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> that was me speaking with power, you know? And the Lord says, it's like the people that I've called you to, they will not respond to you shouting on them. They will not respond to you speaking in the way that you want to speak. But I have sent you to a particular people that you are just tailor-made for them. As you speak, they respond to your message. Do you know that people don't like bread? And they say, yeah, the best thing is sliced bread. People don't like sliced bread. <laughs> you know that people don't like ice cream? You know that people don't like pineapple? I'm going somewhere. You know people don't like chocolate? Do you know? Not that they're allergic. They don't like chocolate. People don't like it. They don't like chocolate. There are people that don't like chocolate. I know. Ice cream, they don't like. Pineapple, they don't like. Even Jesus, they do not like. I hear you. So why do I want to be liked by everybody? I hear you. But the people that I'm sent to, they will hear me, a fire will burn in their hearts. If I do what I'm supposed to do, if everybody does what they're supposed to do, we will ignite this world for God. And I rest my kiss. Omo, let's clap, let's clap. Let's clap. So finally, as we drop the mic, 
I want to abuse Manu, but I can't abuse Manu because but Manu will be fringe below Astor again. But I want to say this to you. Mm -hmm. You're a powerful lady. You're a powerful lady, for real, not fake. How has, how have you been able to manage marriage? <laughs> I end up here. It's just three minutes. How you, do you want to ask a question in three minutes? I have to quickly <laughs> drop it and drop one away. Like, most powerful lady, most powerful, uh, so I, 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 work in, I work in media, so I've, I've seen stuff. Do you drop this power and just be a wife? How, how have you been able to? First of all, is in the spirit of authenticity, that you are powerful doesn't mean you always feel powerful, okay. right? I've just learned to just do what needs to be done, you know, and okay. the power will come along the road, right? But one of the great things that God did for me, I remember when I was doing my PhD, somebody called me, we went to NYC together, and the person called me and said, ah, we are doing PhD. Boys will run, no? I said, boys will run, men will stay. Am I oh, a man? No. <laughs> Oh, more. <laughs> right, the man. And he's a great man. He's a fantastic person. And if you've seen my husband, you know that he's the person for me. Like, he stands. And he's very supportive. And he's never, ever... I mean, we clash with the fight to forget. We still fought life last week. <laughs> yeah? You know? But um, one thing about him, he's never felt intimidated by anything that I'm doing because he's secure in himself. And he's also secure in the agenda for God for my life, right? So he pushes me. In fact, today I was like, <clears throat> I won't put you on blast. Floyd did not send me the questions. What am I going to do? He said, you got this. That's him. Do you know what I mean? Like, he supports. He is dedicated to my success. And that's why you have to marry not just a God-fearing man, but your friend. A lot of times we do all these things about butterflies. I have butterflies, but he's my friend. He's my best friend at the end of the day. So even when we fight, we fight as friends, and we come back as friends. And I think that that's what is necessary, because one thing, and we're rounding up, that we know that the devil is fighting is kingdom marriages. He's fighting marriages in general. How, how many years? Eight, it's, eight years. Eight years, yeah. He's fighting marriages in general. But when you have an idea that you are put together for a reason and you are answerable to God, it makes all the difference in, in the journey. Esther, it, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so and much for having me. I didn't send any questions, but if you I sent any questions, question. you would, but you see, you see, you, this, this should not kill it. Mm -hmm. Come on, just put your hands together for an incredible <laughs> Esther. Thank you, please okay. um, follow her on Instagram, Esther Longe. Um, follow all her expressions, the Alternative Business School, God in real life. life. Does Adulam, she has what they call Adulam. They did not allow me to open new Instagram. So I have to Adulam is like, it's <laughs> Let me, let me, let me, let me. That, that, <laughs> that now, did you join that? You nah. did it like that. Yeah. It's not like that. Don't answer for it. It's not like that. It's not like that, please. But she it's has like all that. her expressions. Please follow her. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Her passion for Nigeria is real. Um, and I repent when I meet you. Because in me, I think LA. Los Angeles, I just LA think so. LA is Lagos. <laughs> Foy of LA. Foy of Lagos. Not Lily. Lily. LA. Thank you so much for coming. Thank for, you. For Thank, you. Thank, Thank you so much. You it's been amazing. See you all next week. It's Full Current. Please make some noise. Woo! Thank you.